be the discussion will be about geothermal within the recently published European external energy strategy. Just to point to briefly the project Geoenergy Europe. So this project is supported by the European Commission program called COSME um, about cluster. And the, um, the objective is to exchange between different cluster in the geoenergy uh, sector, and for case uh, in geothermal, um, to help and support the export of European technologies from small and medium enterprise outside Europe. So here we will see a bit today um, one axe of development, which is uh, within, within a strategy. Uh, the project uh, Geo Energy Europe uh, started already four years ago with the first uh, sequ sequence. Uh, um, and now is in the second part of the development of the project and it will end end of this year. You have all the information in the project website. So today, what we are discussing, when my computer will be ready to show you the second slide, <laughs> this technical problem happened, but it's coming. Um, it's uh, to uh, our first a presentation from the European Commission about um, this uh, strategy, uh, this European um, external energy strategy. Then uh, we give the floor to um, Dario Montani from, from COSVIG, also a partner of uh, Geoenergy Europe project, and he will speak about the lessons learned from the first activities of a geothermal, of a Geoenergy Europe project. And then we will give the floor to my colleague Thomas Garabetian to present the case of European export agencies. So this is a topic for, for, for discussion also, and to see how this can be um, done uh, in uh, the future and then how it's part of the European external strategy. And firstly, I'm struggling with, with a computer issue, but it will arrive soon. Well, anyway, it was not, uh, it's not a, a, a big uh, problem. Um, I don't have many slides, but it was just to present you the <coughs> agenda. What is clear is that the um, European Commission, and I will give the floor to Alessandro Polito, has given <coughs> a clear signal now recently with the report EU plan that uh, Europe should be less dependent on uh, external uh, for the security of energy supply, but probably should also play a better role and a bigger role in the global energy transition. And here, probably the export of European technologies could be one of this um, activity of having a better role on the global arena. So Alessandro, thank you for your ability and for presenting today. So this European external strategy refers you. Thank you, Philippe, and thank you and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alessandro Polito. I work in DG Energy in the uh, directorate, which is in charge, among other things, of renewables in Unit C1, which deals with renewable energy and energy system integration. Uh, as such, we are specifically in charge of, of renewables and related legislation and policies. In particular, of course, we are in the lead for the uh, negotiations with Council and Parliament at the moment on the proposal to amend uh, the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, and within the context, we also we also promoted several initiatives that are part of the Repower EU plan, uh, among which, for example, uh, the permitting guidance and recommendation, the permitting proposal, which also aims to amend the Renewable Energy Directive, the solar strategy, uh, and, and also we are strictly involved uh, in hydrogen, specifically renewable hydrogen, with the targets uh, for consumption in industry and transport that we set in the uh, in red too, uh, and also with all the policies related to it, including, for example, the hydrogen accelerator proposed in in Repower EU. Uh, I'm here as a, as a, 
uh, was already announced by Philippe Amir to present the external energy engagement strategy, and more specifically uh, the part concerning uh, renewables, as, as usually our colleagues in Task Force 3, the former international unit, are in charge of the, of the file. Um, but specifically for renewables, we also have a, 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 an important role when it comes to its international dimension. So it's uh, it's me together with another colleague, they, some of you may know, Mathieu Ballou, we are in charge of the international aspects. Uh, so before going to the specific aspects of the, of the strategy, of the external strategy and the renewables element that are including in it, it's probably good to have a to make uh, to make a step back and uh, and 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 frame it within uh, the context in which the strategy was uh, uh, was uh, uh, was foreseen was planned. That is the Repower EU plan. Uh, you know that following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the EU faced a sort of a existential threat. Um, uh, due in part to uh, existing elements, uh, climate, I'm referring to, to climate change there specifically, but they were worsened and our action required faster uh, faster response following the, the, the Russian aggression of Ukraine. This exacerbated the, some, some trends that were already there in terms of a uh, price increase, uh, tightening energy, uh, supply volatility of prices, uh, and in general, uh, uh, I would say generalized risk in terms of energy security across the block, across the globe. So this is why we put in place this Repower EU uh, plan on 18 May, uh, which is a direct response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Its purpose, as as you all know, of course, is to get rid of Russian imports of fossil fuels, primarily uh, natural gas, but also oil and and coal by 2027. Uh, so basically, its purpose is uh, to to provide uh, to give Europe uh, higher strategic resilience and independence from a supplier which uh, demonstrated to be an unreliable one. Um, one important thing to take into account when we discuss uh, both Repower EU plan uh, in general and the external aspects more specifically is that this is. Uh, a sort of emergency emergency plan. Of course, it was drafted in a rush following uh, uh, a specific situation, but at the same time, it has some long-term perspective. So on one side, we look at the short term at the need to get rid of uh, of, uh, of Russian dependence in the short term, but it has also some long-term implication. It includes actions that are relevant mostly for the internal EU level. Uh, to accelerate the energy transformation, to accelerate renewables deployment, energy savings, etc. But it has a very important international side, which implies specifically uh, stronger engagement with our partners. We always had a very, uh, uh, a very strong international element, uh, a predisposition in a way uh, to have a global view and to discuss with partners both a bilateral level, but also a multilateral level and in global fora. But I would say that the Repower EU accelerated, provided a push for this international outreach, because this is very important for one of the objectives of the Repower EU plan, which is to ensure, ensure secure, affordable and sustainable energy for us and for our, for our partners. So what is important to say is that these, uh, the elements that you see in the Repower EU and in the international strategy, although they are a consequence of a specific situation, uh, the, the, invasion, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, they provide some policies which are meant to last. They're meant to last irrespective of whether the situation in Ukraine will change, irrespective of whether the war will end tomorrow or not. So the acceleration that we provide there in acceleration is an acceleration that in the view of the commission at least is meant to remain there, to stay there uh, and not to be watered down or, or, or reduced should the international situation change. That's a very important message I think that we've been uh, also asked several times by, by stakeholders, by the renewables industry, uh, that they want to be sure that there is a, um, there is a stable, there is a, a long-term stable uh, market perspective and regulatory framework. And on this, uh, uh, I think uh, we want to reassure everybody that the intention is, is not to move away from this, from this path. Um, the plan includes uh, a big financing element, 
we calculated that we will need 210 billion euro in additional inv investments in energy saving, in, in diversifying energy supply and in increasing renewables, uh, which seems big, it is big, uh, but it comes on top of what we have foreseen for the fifth or 55 uh, until uh, 2030. And it's just 5% of what we saw in the fifth for 55. And this gives me the occasion just to say another important message that is uh, whatever we have foreseen in the Power EU plan is not a step back from the fifth for 55. It's just uh, on top of it. It's an acceleration of it. Now, coming more to the uh, renewable uh, renewables, uh, um, elements of the plan uh, again what we what we put in the repower you plan and what we put also in the in the external strategy it's just on top of what we have seen in the fit for 55 we had already foreseen in terms of renewables to move from 32 percent renewables to 40 percent in the plan we have proposed to increase this target to 45 percent in um, in the in the proposal to uh, to amend the Ren renewable energy directive this is to reflect our challenges so we need more renewables we need to accelerate and this in our views has to be reflected in the directive uh, you probably know that we are in negotiations with the council and the parliament so the ball is very much at the moment in their in their field uh, it, it does not depend so much on us anymore but that's our clear message that we need uh, even stronger um, ambition compared to the already very high ambition of 40% renewables of energy consumption by, by 2030. Um, there are many challenges to achieve this, uh, this target. Some of them are, as I mentioned, in related more to the internal uh, landscape, uh, complex permitting procedures, for example, remove uh, uh, uncertainty for, for uh, investors, uh, promote the competitiveness of our industry, especially uh, the manufacturing side, securing supply of the supply chain of both components or, or, or raw materials. So these are all elements that we discuss uh, uh, in, in detail. We have measures uh, foreseeing the uh, Repower EU plan, and we have, of course, several forums in which we discuss this issue. But to make, to make the EU, uh, to keep the EU's position as front runner, uh, we need also to engage internationally. Uh, first of all, because we need a global market, we need a global market for our technologies. Uh, we have a huge potential in terms of manufacturing and the global market can provide certainly uh, opportunities for our manufacturers. Uh, but also we have also has to keep in mind that the reason why we push for renewables is to achieve certain climate targets. And we all know that these climate targets, uh, we cannot achieve them alone. So we need to engage with international uh, partners. And we believe that the crisis that was poured by the, by the Russian invasion of Ukraine gives also to our partners some additional motivation uh, to follow our, our, uh, our example. Uh, and on this, our belief, I mean, we, we read every day, I think there are plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, uh, opinion pieces, comments from policymakers, politicians, etc., uh, newspaper saying that with the Repower EU plan, the European Union is making a step back from the from the climate targets and the fit for 55. But as I said before, this is not true. This is not at least what we believe. Uh, the Repower EU plan comes on top of fit for 55. And it's actually an acceleration of the fit for 55. It's a, it's, it's a demonstration that the current crisis calls for uh, uh, further push calls for a faster transformation of our energy system. And this is valid for us, but it's valid for all our partners. We are not the only ones affected by insecurity of supply. We're not the only ones affected by higher prices. Uh, and, and in general, we are the, not the only ones fighting against uh, climate change. So it's a push for us to go forward, but it's a push also for our partners. And we need to be there, ready to engage uh, with these partners, ready to support them uh, to uh, define their pathways to, to climate neutrality. And this is exactly the context and the, where we place our uh, our external strategy. This is exactly uh, the reason why we have an external strategy in place. Um, this external strategy is based on four main uh, pillars. The first one is to reinforce the engagement with partners uh, to, to strengthen their energy security. The second one is to accelerate their green and just energy transition. 
Uh, the third one is to support specifically those that are mostly affected by Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. And the fourth one is to promote our clean energy uh, industry and to, to provide more uh, business opportunities across, across the globe. Um, the strategy replicates a bit the, uh, the, the narrative that uh, characterized the entire Power U plan meaning that we have some uh, short-term needs and some other needs and objectives which are both short-term, medium-term and long-term. The short-term need is, of course, to look for alternative fossil fuel supplies. Again, I will never be tired to repeat, this is not a step back from, from, from the Fit for 55. We are not looking to increase our consumption of fossil fuels. We are not looking to increase our dependency. We are just trying to diversify our, our supply for fossil fuels. And in the same way as we are doing this, also our partners are doing the same. But this is just the short term uh, uh, part of our external energy strategy. And you will see there if you read it or if you plan to read it, uh, that we plan to diversify gas supply, we plan to diversify uh, uh, oil supply. We have engaged in plenty of discussions with partners, memoranda of understanding, uh, additional supply from the traditional partners from North way from um, from Algeria from Azerbaijan uh, supporting infrastructure development within the EU engaging with many African countries including sub-Saharan Africa current exporters for example Nigeria potential exporters like like Senegal uh, exporters who could increase their supply to the EU, like Qatar, partners who are not necessarily producers, but who could divert part of their uh, uh, LNG uh, endowment to the EU. We're thinking about Japan and South Korea. So there is uh, this part which is uh, important, uh, but this has always to be considered as a short term engagement. Uh, which we want to frame within a longer term perspective, which is the one to foster the green transition. A green transition, which is uh, in, in the context of our strategy, is not only um, is not only a, a, a climate plan. It's not only a growth strategy, also, but it's also a security strategy. So more than ever, we've always uh, supported the idea that renewables are fundamental for energy security. This was always part of our messages, uh, but this has never been so true as it is now. So uh, this is an element that is very much highlighted in the strategy. The renewables give more security. Security of supply, uh, price stability, less volatility, and a better environment in terms of uh, international geopolitical aspects, but also in terms of uh, economic stability. Um, the, the next years, but I would say already now, actually, but the next in the next years even more, we will see a new international landscape, uh, which is very different from what we've seen so far. Uh, there will be new trade patterns in terms of energy that we didn't see uh, before. Uh, trade in conventional energy will uh, will decline. New commodities will emerge, for example, uh, hydrogen and, and ammonia. Ammonia is already a traded good. But with renewable ammonia, we foresee an increase in in uh, in trade, and there will be a higher request for uh, uh, for uh, um, low carbon uh, products and low carbon uh, technologies. There will be new standards, new certification, uh, new rules that we'll have to set up. That will have to be set up to uh, uh, to ensure that there is a, a working market, that there is a, a market without without barriers and a functioning uh, one. And all of this will be brought by the simple fact that renewable energy will increase more and more. And there will be a, a paradigm shift uh, compared to what we've seen in the hydrocarbon era, let's say, uh, because hydrocarbons are concentrated in few countries. 80% of the world population lives in areas uh, that are energy importers. And this is going to change radically. Renewables can be produced everywhere in the world. Uh, they can be produced with very high potential in countries that were not 
necessarily uh, hydrocarbon producers. In some cases, they were. Think about Algeria. They produce and export hydrocarbons, but they could. Uh, they have a huge potential for renewables uh, uh, and and for potential exports. But the, the the landscape will change. We will be less dependent from foreign countries thanks to renewables and energy savings. And even in those cases where we will have a dependency. Uh, this will be less concentrated because, as I said, uh, renewables can be produced everywhere and we can import them from everywhere. And hydrogen there provides a good opportunity to import renewables. Hydrogen is a way to import basically renewable electricity through, through, through other forms. So this will uh, give us more leverage, will give us more opportunity to choose our partners and to rely on, on credible ones. Um, uh, we, we, in order to promote renewables in, in third countries, we need to have a stronger engagement. We need to promote uh, energy partnerships, uh, and these partnerships need to be need to be uh, encompassing different aspects, not be limited to only some technologies. You might have heard recently about uh, numerous hydrogen partnerships. It's important to provide the message that these partnerships do not only focus on hydrogen, they are always uh, uh, focused in general on renewables, on promoting renewables. And our main message to third countries, it's always the priority has to be the, the, your decarbonization, the decarbonization of your energy system. It doesn't make sense in our perspective just to uh, increase hydrogen production, export hydrogen possibly, and then have a very much fossil-based energy system. So uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, a thorough approach with third countries in which we want to cover the general decarbonization of the energy system. And this is one of the main messages of the, of the external hydrogen strategy when it comes uh, to, to renewables. Um, our engagement is all across the world, but of course we have some priorities. Uh, the Western Balkans, of course, given also the, the, the proximity and the close integration with our energy system. Africa, the Mediterranean specifically, but also South Africa, where we have our uh, EU Africa uh, Green Energy Initiative, um, and also the Indo-Pacific region for reasons specifically linked link to the fact that they are uh, big polluters and big emitters. Um, we have put in place some tools to facilitate this uh, cooperation and to and to spur investments and, and increase renewables deployment uh, through the Global Guide Gateway that you probably uh, all know. It's based on the Team Europe approach, so it's uh, it's coordinated with the member states, and its aim is to support initiatives like the EU Africa Green Energy Initiative or the uh, Just Energy Transition partnerships that we that we are put in place. Uh, at COP26, we launch a Just Transition partnership with South Africa to promote the decarbonization and the coal phasing out, but there are some others being, uh, being negotiated. Um, one important part of the strategy that I mentioned already is to uh, support closer partners, especially those mostly affected by, by Russian invasion of Ukraine. So Ukraine, of course, but also Moldova, Georgia, and the Western part, the partners. Um, we do it in many ways within the energy community, of course, which is the main uh, uh, the main legal framework where we cooperate with them. But we have bilateral dialogues, we have specific funding for them, and very importantly, we included them. We gave them the possibility to participate to the EU Energy Platform, which is this voluntary scheme for the common purchase of uh, uh, natural gas. So that's uh, an important instrument in which we included these uh, these partners. Um, Africa, I mentioned already, and our uh, southern neighborhood are uh, are uh, a main focus of our external uh, action. Um, we will continue to work with them on many fronts. Uh, partly, of course, especially with some countries uh, on fossil fuel imports. But as I said, especially when we create uh, some new uh, natural gas patterns, we always introduce uh, some long-term elements. And so we look at hydrogen, but we look in general at the uh, broader decarbonization of the system and trade in renewables, business-to-business uh, uh, -business opportunities, and to open uh, possibilities for our uh, uh, industry, for our manufacturers to export their, their technology. Uh, to conclude, a couple of elements that are also mentioned in the strategy concern critical raw materials. 
very important for certain uh, for certain sectors we risk having uh, some some new dependencies there there is a strong action there is a, there are specific uh, specific actions mentioned in the strategy in particular we are discussing a partnership with some countries we do already have one with canada we have one with U ukraine which of course at the moment is frozen we are negotiating some uh, partnership with, with namibia discuss with south africa so it's very important what we are doing to diversify the supply of critical and raw materials but we're very active uh, in uh, multilateral fora, within IRENA, within IEA, where there are uh, new collaborative uh, instruments to discuss critical raw materials. And also our colleagues from DigiGrow are uh, reflecting on a new uh, new plan, new strategy, let's call it, on, on critical raw materials. So uh, new instruments to deal with the supply of critical raw materials. And finally, a last element that is important is in terms of, uh, of uh, trade. So uh, we want to promote our uh, the export of our technologies abroad. Uh, and, and of course, we will coordinate more and more our climate and energy policies with our trade policies to make sure that the increase uh, of renewable uh, renewables deployment in our partners also provides uh, benefits for our manufacturers uh, and to conclude just for those who don't know it uh, we we have a forum the clean energy industrial forum uh, which uh, i myself deal with i'm the organizer within dg energy which deals with several of these topics and and of course issues like uh, uh, critical raw materials trade are also part of the possible discussions of the forum and 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 will probably be also topics to be addressed in in future meetings of the forum that's uh, that's all on my side uh, if you have any questions of course or or topics for discussion i'm i'm happy to to participate i'm actually have to jump to another meeting but i can stay maybe for another five minutes maximum Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, indeed, and we have already one question for you. It's a question from Taras Popadinets. Is If you could specify if any initiative within the report you plan is on the table from the EU side to support Ukraine particularly, for example, common program grants, etc. Thanks. Me, I'm, if I'm not wrong, I think in uh, Horizon Europe, project indeed there have been initiatives to include uh, some ukraine partners when, whenever possible but maybe alessandro you can clarify that i mean the, uh, there are uh, there are uh, several elements to support ukraine um i don't think i will manage to recollect all of them but first of all you know very well that right after the the war we synchronized our electricity system with ukraine which was a fundamental move to ensure uh, that we increase the security of supply uh, uh, of electricity for ukraine uh, we are working on reverse flow of natural gas from the countries neighboring Ukraine, uh, from the EU member states that are neighbor of Ukraine, to make sure also that there is a, a uninterrupted flow of, of gas. Uh, so that's that's another important aspect. Um, there is a, a, a wide uh, build back better plan for Ukraine, uh, which includes also energy. So the idea is also in the future to focus. I mean, uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's maybe not uh, not uh, politically correct to say that uh, in the in the tragic context that they're living, but they have an opportunity after the war uh, to build to rebuild again their uh, their energy system on more solid basis and 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 to address it towards a, a deeper and faster decarbonization path. And there we will have a role because we will put in place uh, certainly a substantial amount of money to reconstruct. We have the global gateway that I've already mentioned. Um, we are supporting Ukraine as well as all the other uh, energy community partners in their uh, energy reforms. Uh, so um, uh, supporting them in their alignment with our legislation, convincing them to have high renewable energy targets. So that's also, uh, of course, part of our, our support. We have in place a, a, a critical raw material partnership. We have intensive discussion regarding a possible uh, hydrogen cooperation in the future. Uh, Ukraine has plans, at least their, their, uh, their private operators, they have plans to export renewable electricity to the EU. 
uh, so that will also provide them with important business opportunities. Um, th that's it, pretty much. I don't, I don't recall uh, all the elements, but I'm pretty sure I'm missing something else. But just to say that the idea is, of course, to uh, to extend all the main uh, policies and support mechanisms that we will foresee internally also to these uh, to these uh, to these close uh, partners uh, i think indeed that they can also apply to funds uh, i'm not sure whether they can do under the innovation fund as well i don't think so i think it's limited to to the eu norway and, and iceland alone uh, but probably they can apply for, for uh, Horizon Europe funds. But anyway, I think the biggest source of support in that case will be the global gateway. No, indeed, I think for Horizon Europe, uh, there have been a new provision to allow scientists, especially from Ukraine, to, to participate to projects. From our side, we're also in contact with institutes um, of energy in, in Ukraine. And because they are doing some investigation and what you are mentioning, critical raw materials, and in geothermal, we know that we have some minerals like lithium, and uh, know that there are some ongoing investigation and geothermal lithium in Ukraine. So, opportunities for further work when we hope soon the war will be ending. Do we have more questions to Alessandro? Because indeed, he was mentioning that he has to leave. No? No more questions. So, thank you, Alessandro. I think it's because your question was really clear. Uh, thank you for your ability and uh, if you want to stay more you are welcome to stay with us some more minutes no thank I you very much give the floor to dario bonciani from cosvig to present the lessons learned from the project geoenergy europe activities dario the floor is yours thank you thank you philip <clears throat> i try to share my screen i have a presentation okay. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, I will give you just an introduction to lessons learned uh, from the Geoenergy Europe uh, project activities. Uh, to start, uh, uh, our target countries, the target countries of the Geoenergy Europe project are Chile, Canada, Kenya, and Costa Rica. Uh, they were selected because they have a, a good geothermal potential and uh, a, a, in, a geothermal industry under development uh, at different levels. And uh, we engaged our um, members miss the, the miss of our uh, clusters uh, in different phases uh, the, the, to, to train them and to, to coach them in, um, in entering in the, in the target in the target markets uh, before we liaise with uh, these um, SMEs to, to understand what are their, uh, their expectations, their objectives, uh, and, uh, and also to, uh, to have updates on the state of the art of these countries, because some, count, some uh, SMEs uh, are already working in these countries. Uh, then uh, with these um, informations, we, we prepare uh, the uh, training session to give information uh, on the market, on the following market visit and also on the, on the market uh, conditions in, and general information in, information in that countries. And, uh, and then uh, we organize the market visit and, uh, mm, and we, we, get info, we get feedbacks from, uh, uh, from all the, from the, um, from the, 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 the SMEs that uh, participated to the, to, the, to the market visits to, to have their feedbacks and 
impressions and uh, to analyze the market and uh, and different points uh, concerning the market. Uh, in this presentation, I will focus mainly on Chile uh, because uh, uh, it was the, the first market visit that we had that we held uh, at the beginning of um, uh, last April. And uh, after, of course, after the, 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 the COVID uh, pandemic, and uh, why, Chile, why we choose Chile uh, among the target countries? Because uh, it has a good, very good uh, geothermal potential. They, have, uh, they can develop uh, uh, around four gigawatt of geothermal energy. Uh, there, is also, there are also opportunities for the low temperature uh, geothermal energy for direct uses. Um, the, so the geothermal energy can be developed uh, in, next, in next years. Uh, the LCOE uh, is uh, acceptable, but there are some uh, um, uh, weaknesses uh, related to the availability to the places where where the geothermal resource is available, which is in the Andes, so in the in the mountain. Uh, Chile has uh, is one of the few countries in the southern in the South America uh, having a, a regulatory framework on geothermal energy concession, concessions. Um, uh, the government uh, already invested money in the in the geothermal sector, uh, mainly uh, concerning the risk mitigation in geothermal exploration. They already have uh, a geothermal power plant, and uh, and Chile aims to uh, achieve the electricity carbon neutrality uh, by 2015. 50, sorry. Uh, the market visit. The market visit was organized uh, um, in uh, Santiago del Chile. Uh, it was organized at the Andean Geothermal uh, Center of Excellence at the University of, C of Chile. Uh, the participants uh, at the market visit were uh, the Ministry of Energy of Chile, uh, the SIGA, of course, uh, and the Geothermal Energy Council. Among companies, there were two companies uh, uh, that are mm, uh, multinational companies, uh, but they have the headquarters uh, also in Chile. One, the first one is uh, Transmark Renewables, uh, a Dutch company, and, uh, mm, and the Enel Green Power. Then we, uh, we participated uh, uh, among clusters uh, you know, with the French cluster and us. And we involved uh, six uh, European companies in this market visit. We brought them uh, in Chile to present their activities and to make business there. Uh, the, the, the feedbacks received during the, the market visit uh, about the policy and uh, regulatory framework is um, uh, concern uh, uh, challenges and drivers for the development of geothermal sector. The challenges are that it's not possible to change the temperature and chemical composition of uh, the injected fluid. Uh, mm, geothermal has to compete with other renewables. Uh, so maybe these renewables um, involve uh, less uh, investments cost for the installation of um, for the installation of uh, plants, but uh, the, the market and the market price uh, does not take into account uh, attributes uh, that, uh, for example, the 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 the, the, the renew, uh, renewable energy as geothermal, uh, the benefits that uh, uh, renewable energy as geothermal um, invo um, re uh, concern uh, on the electricity grid, for example, uh, because uh, it's flexible, uh, is base load, uh, and is locally available. Um, the, there is a need of a specific uh, legislation on heating and cooling um, 
to distinguish the geothermal gen power generation. Uh, there is a need uh, of permanent, permanent uh, uh, risk uh, um, mitigation scheme and uh, the need to improve the energy auctions. Uh, the drivers, uh, uh, the, the government is uh, modifying the, 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 the geothermal law and Chile is setting up uh, measures to promote and accelerate the geothermal sector. Uh, there, is, there is a guide on the development uh, in particular for the environmental assessment of geothermal uh, power plants and uh, there are activities to liaise with uh, indigenous Com, um, communities. The, the Cilian Geothermal um, Council uh, initiated a promotion, uh, a discussion to promote uh, the, extraction, the extract, extraction of lithium from brines. And uh, there are, uh, and the regulations concerning electricity are quite clear. Uh, the, in general, the, 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 the feedbacks received by the, the company there are that uh, uh, it, there are some difficulties uh, uh, in reaching the, 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 the places uh, where the geothermal energy is available. Uh, there are possibilities to extract lithium uh, and uh, uh, yes, in particular to extract lithium and raw materials from uh, uh, from geothermal brines, but uh, the, the current uh, uh, regulatory framework, framework uh, hampers this development. And, uh, but yes, and, um, and there is a lack of, uh, uh, of a, a geothermal supply chain in Chile. So this uh, results in uh, difficulties in uh, developing the, uh, in developing the, the, the sector in the country. Uh, and then the social acceptance is quite low. Uh, concluding, uh, Chile is a country with uh, a stable economic uh, point of view. Uh, it, there is a high geothermal potential, but uh, we have to, to resolve some uh, concerns. Um, the supply chain, uh, in, in particular, the supply chain is poorly developed, so this increased the, 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 the cost for maintenance and installation of geothermal plants. Uh, moreover, there is a possibilities to develop uh, uh, geothermal heat pumps, but uh, as for the deep geothermal sector, the supply chain is rather is not completed, and uh, most of uh, parts uh, or for, for example, of a geothermal heat pump sec, uh, plant uh, are coming from Spain and Germany. And there is the needing to develop skills and technical uh, and technical knowledge. Uh, the follow as follow up actions to, to to go ahead and promote and develop the the, the geothermal uh, sector in Chile and promote uh, cooperation with European co companies. Uh, we have to um, to develop actions under the diplomatic point of view. Uh, we agreed to uh, prepare a letter to be forwarded to the ministries of energy and foreign affairs uh, and embassies in Chile, the ministries, uh, of course, uh, of the uh, countries of the partner of the uh, Geoenergy Europe partner uh, uh, partner clusters uh, to propose the EJEC action plan uh, with eight actions uh, to repower EU uh, with geothermal, uh, to organize uh, a, a visit of Chilean delegation here in Europe um, and organize workshops and, and uh, meeting uh, occasion, uh, opportunities uh, with, uh, uh, Chilean, with the Chilean uh, partners. And uh, uh, the action, uh, uh, other action, we have to structurize a uh, value chain and worldwide collaboration uh, on the Chilean uh, in, with Chile. So improve the partnership with uh, uh, Chilean Geothermal Council and uh, to set up a worldwide network of centers of excellence on geothermal energy. Uh, thank you.
uh, give the floor to Philippe and then to Alessandro Murlat. Thank you, Dario, for this presentation. Indeed, now we will uh, move to a um, kind of a case study, so presentation of a company. So from Mr. Alessandro Murazu from uh, Hero Geo Service. So the case of being a geothermal small and medium enterprise in search of internationalization. So Alessandro, the floor is yours. Yes. Good afternoon, and um, I have one small presentation. I'm sorry, I am calling you from from my car because uh, I I have one uh, visit in my hospital, and so I I, I connect to you in um, now from my car. I have also one presentation, but I'm not able now from uh, from my phone to to send. Uh, uh, the images maybe uh, maybe Dario that have my presentation can do can do for me. Uh, anyway, I can uh, represent and I can um, present to you what is the result of our uh, recent, really recent and past week uh, visit to Canada uh, that uh, we um, realized with Geo Energy and the coordination of uh, the Irish, uh, Irish uh, people, and uh, especially from Joe Mongan that organized our, our visit in, uh, uh, so thank you. I know you can, you can go on with the other page. So I want to show what is the, the result of our visit from, uh, from in June uh, now this month uh, in, uh, in, in Canada. Uh, we start uh, our visit for us is a good opportunities for uh, this small, our small company and that works in geothermal and environmental impact assessment of uh, and from renewable energy in, especially in Italy. And so for us is a good, good chance to, uh, to present our knowledge and to, to work together with other uh, European company like uh, uh, Hungarian, like uh, Irish and other Italian companies that work together and visit together Canadian uh, markets in, in this month. And uh, in the beginning, the, the, the program consists to, uh, to visit one um, new, new, um, new experiment, power generation uh, and um, Eating generation from uh, one Canadian company that is uh, Ever, and uh, uh, to visit the Global Energy Show Conference and uh, exhibition in Calgary, uh, Alberta, and uh, uh, to uh, the, our program was also to uh, meet together with Canadian uh, companies and with European companies in uh, Toronto and uh, the 13. Uh, in, um, in a meeting uh, organized by, by Joe Mongan of the Geo Energy uh, Group. And, uh, uh, and this was done in Toronto in the 13th of June. So starting from the visit that you can see in the other, in the other, uh, the other image, if you can go on. Yes, and, and now I want to present uh, what is the result of our visit in uh, Ivor team uh, group that uh, we meet Neil Botwell, uh, Paul Kearns, uh, Janine Vani that uh, are engineering uh, of the company of the Canadian company Ivor. We have already um, one uh, project together with Ivor with uh, this Canadian company in Italy, in uh, Pantelleria especially, where we are trying, we have a very high temperature gradient geothermal gradient in Pantelleria. We want to reply the experience uh, of the project of Ivor uh, also here in, in Europe and uh, especially in Italy. So we visit the, the um, experimental um, plant and, uh, and in this area of Alberta, we have a lot of information uh, regarding geothermal. We have a normal uh, geothermal gradient there but they, uh, as you, I think, as you know, they have realized this uh, special uh, new project of um, heating exchange with uh, with the ground uh, that produce heat uh, without uh, without pump. The, the the project is called Evor uh, One Number One, and uh, uh, so we we have 
we visit this, this, this plant, we visit a very good area where we have a lot of information about the ground uh, due to oil and gas exploration. They say to us that there are more than 130,000 um, uh, oil and gas well, uh, deep also four, five uh, kilometers. And so we have a lot, they have a lot of information about the, the, the ground and about the gradient and the temperature and the uh, lithology and stratigraphy of the area. So during this visit it was very important to meet them and to see another new, uh, uh, new, uh, new, new, new power plant, not power, but uh, new experiment uh, power plant or eating exchange that been, can we, we can apply also in some other areas of, in the world, especially where we have convection uh, and where you have a uh, low permeability system uh, and to where we can change the heating with the ground uh, to produce electricity and to produce heating. And during this uh, visit, uh, we um, with Joe uh, Mongan from uh, Irish, uh, we have organized some um, meeting with, uh, with the other Canadian company like uh, Frontier uh, Project Solution, Invest Alberta, uh, Terrapin, and Alberta Number no. One. During this meeting uh, that was done in the Global Energy Show in Calgary, uh, we, um, we, have understand, we have understood that uh, the mm, geothermal, the potential geothermal developing of in uh, Canada is not so uh, high and diffused, but is uh, concentrated in the Alberta region, in the British, uh, in, the, in the British, uh, uh, British uh, area at north of Alberta, uh, uh, where in, in nearby the. Um, to realize uh, some, some new, three new um, deep geothermal projects uh, to produce electricity and uh, to produce heating and to separate uh, lithium too. And this project, the most important project is Alberta number one, uh, that is composed in six wells and um, three of in, in, uh, production and three of injection and they want to use all the uh, hot water that they will found uh, for produce electricity for district heating industrial district heating and for to produce uh, from brine from water uh, sorry uh, the the lithium that they will found in the in the in the hot water uh, at the deep around uh, between the three and four thousand uh, meters deep um, mostly 4,000 meters deep. And uh, so this is a very good experience. We give to them the, uh, the chance to, uh, to connect with us and to, uh, to collaborate with us and with the other uh, company that visits Canada and uh, with the project Geoenergy to give us our knowledge of the, of the project uh, to apply in, uh, in uh, this, small part of Canada that is uh, in Alberta and British Columbia, where uh, we can apply uh, some, uh, not much, but some, uh, some other projects for to produce electricity. And we can collaborate with Alberta number one. And uh, we can also realize very, very, another very good important project that we understand that in Calgary, they have the same condition that uh, we have in, uh, uh, in Europe, we have in Mon Munich or in the Po Valley in Italy or in uh, in uh, France in Paris, where we have uh, they have hot water 70, 80 degree uh, at uh, two, three thousand meters uh, deep in limestones and dolomite uh, uh, in in the area of Alberta and uh, and Calgary. So we suggest to them to work together. Uh, for uh, some new project to climate, 
to climate the 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 towns uh, like Calgary that have a very high, very high potential use of uh, this heating because you know that the temperature in Calgary is also minus uh, 30 degrees so they use a lot of heat and so they can use uh, the heat of the our 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 ground our planet and not and the earth and not to burn anything but the problem that we uh, find is that the uh, the, uh, the energy cost in canada is very low and uh, they have a lot of uh, oil and gas uh, wells and uh, potential and so it's uh, it's not easy to convert but they start now to have this idea and we uh, we want to collaborate with them with Joe uh, Mongan, with the uh, with the Hungarian and uh, other Italians uh, company, we want to present the opportunity to work in this project. At now, we have uh, some feedback from this visit, but uh, still uh, to not not passed not, uh, not much time and less than one week, and so that at now we are waiting for the feedback from. Uh, the meeting with these companies and uh, the other the other um, the other opportunities you can go on with the presentation is uh, uh, in uh, was was in toronto in the the pdac uh, in the pdac um, we uh, organize uh, in toronto this meeting and uh, we organize it together and there we understand that we have we have a potential uh, opportunities that we want to, to grow up together um, uh, with all the participants uh, to these projects. And uh, so we are waiting for the, the feedback from the, our, our colleagues in, in, Canada, in Canada. And um, but was also the occasion to meet uh, uh, in the PDAC, uh, the World uh, Premier Mineral and Exploration and Mining Convention, that is the most important in the world uh, in Toronto. Uh, we meet, we, we find a lot of uh, new occasion, not only in Canada, but also in South America. My company has, uh, connect, has been connected in these days with two projects, one is in Nevada and the other in, uh, in Argentina, nearby Chile, where they have high gradient and where they have already uh, the, um, the authorization, the license to extract lithium in the, uh, from the brine. So uh, we, um, we, we have meet we have meet uh, these people and uh, this um, owner of the project, and from that point of view, we have we connect uh, a lot of opportunities uh, that uh, are they join together between who want to uh, research the brine and uh, to extract the lithium from brine, and at the same time we explain to them that we can go on also together to produce electricity with the ORC and plant, uh, power plant and geothermal wells and with the, the, the extraction of brine. That's very important. I think is one of the most important uh, developing uh, that we can uh, apply in, in, in many parts of the world. And so uh, we are really happy to to participate to this visit in Canada because we understand a lot of opportunities. We are trying to maintain our contacts and uh, especially to, um, to develop the, uh, the extraction of lithium in a, a really a new uh, um, geothermal power plant with zero emission. And uh, so I, I want to say thank you to the to Geo Energy group and uh, for us is a one good good opportunities and we uh, we like we we hope that uh, next days next weeks uh, together with the other colleagues from uh, irish and from hungarian and italy uh, to uh, develop together uh, some uh, project especially for eating district eating and uh, to collaborate in uh, alberta number one 
that is the deep geothermal well in uh, in uh, in uh, Calgary, and uh, and to maybe to develop some new collaboration with some potential uh, potential uh, uh, new projects that want to uh, apply the geothermal power plant to the extraction of lithium. That at now we have seen is a very good connection connection uh, due to the uh, the both the presence of the lithium together always and often often connected with the high potential geothermal potential uh, of the area. Thank you, and uh, this is my presentation, and uh, I hand here. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Indeed, it's always good to hear from from the market actors their their experience, and uh, it's always always a good feedback. Now to end this webinar, we have uh, a discussion, but before we give the floor to Thomas Garabetian to present the case for European Export Agency on renewables. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you all for, for participating in, uh, in this webinar and for attending. Apologies for, for the short delay, which is uh, due to some uh, technical issues. Uh, you should be able not to see my uh, presentation hopefully in full screen so what i'm going to to present to you is making a, a bit of a case for uh, a european uh, geothermal export agency but more generally actually and more realistically a european renewable energy export agency because typically what we we are seeing first to to look at the the global market i'm sure many of you are aware uh, but maybe some of you a bit less so globally geothermal is very much geared toward uh, geothermal electricity especially when it comes to global trade um, europe is an important actor as you can see here we have about uh, one gigawatt of uh, geothermal energy capacity for electricity in the European Union. Um, and there is about, um, but I mean, it's much less, for instance, than the US, where uh, there is a 3.7 gigawatts, uh, or countries like the Philippines or Indonesia, where there's about two gigawatts. But what we have seen also is that with very close partnerships with the European industry, Turkey went in a little bit less than 15 years from almost no geothermal electricity capacity to today uh, almost uh, two gigawatts of installed uh, capacity. So uh, we have in Europe a very important know also in this segment, but we also have a very, very important uh, know-how on the heating and cooling sector where uh, we use most of, uh, of the geothermal, especially in district heating and cooling where we have uh, throughout Europe about five gigawatts of uh, installed capacity and in geothermal pumps where we use um, I mean according to, to some estimates but uh, we have about a, a third of the global uh, installed capacity in this technology um, now one of the challenges uh, that we have for exporting geothermal energy is that typically the technologies are not a commodity product, like, for instance, solar panels, which are very easy to export because you just put them in a container and then you can uh, transport them, or wind turbine, which has I mean, they are more complex machines, but still they are very standardized. You just have to install them. Um, so it, it is a bit easier. Geothermal, it's more project driven in terms of uh, where the value lies. So you can export some components, things like turbines, things like, uh, I don't know, pipes, um, uh, pumps, heat exchanger, these kind of things. But much of the value actually lies in uh, exporting know-how, exporting uh, project development capacity, etc. Uh, typically, drilling, for instance, as a service, is a very, very important segment of the cost of a plant. It represents between 40 to 70 percent of total project cost. Um, and uh, we also have the important barrier that is a geothermal resource risk, and overall, the fact that geothermal projects are very capital intensive. So any type of risk has a very, very important impact on the financing cost, which really uh, uh, increases uh, the total cost of a project. If you borrow money at 2% uh, or if you borrow at 2.5% on the long term, this is a, a very, very important uh, uh, difference. Um, and it's also quite difficult uh, overall for 
international companies to uh, access uh, the right information in, in new markets. And uh, that is a bit what the, the Geo Energy Europe project has been trying to improve uh, on some target markets. But this lack of information is a component of risk as well. Um, and important thing as well to, to understand is that um, to understand a new market, we really need to understand the local energy system. We need to understand to navigate a new and uh, often complex legal regulatory and uh, legal uh, framework and, uh, and regulatory framework. Uh, we need to find trustworthy partners uh, and also to understand how the financing sector works locally, uh, what are the public schemes, who is a relevant private partner, etc., uh, to provide finance. Um, geological data may also be quite hard to access or given preferentially to, for instance, incumbent uh, local uh, actors. Um, but I mean, we also have to keep in mind that geothermal companies, and this was very well presented by uh, uh, also Alessandro, don't have to export a full project. They can also export segments of a project, things like equipment sales, service provisions uh, on, uh, on a, to a given project developers, etc. cetera. Um, so there's very different realities uh, in the end to what it means to, to industrialize. Um, maybe going very quickly over that because uh, this was also a bit mentioned uh, overall by uh, uh, by Dario, but what is very crucial uh, for um, accelerating uh, and having a, a good quality uh, internationalization of uh, geothermal projects is really to have uh, capacity building. So marginally just companies that are more performant when it comes to, to export, they have more know-how, more resources, more experience. Um, innovation is a very, very important driver of, um, of uh, exports and especially of the value proposition of exports from geothermal uh, companies in the uh, international space and here it's very very crucial to have a strong internal market where you can scale up and bring this innovation to uh, to mature market maturity and then to be able to propose it in a more competitive environment where this innovative product with its uh, benefits in terms of performance or new services will have this competitive advantage um, we also have one issue that is a lack of uh, uh, structure, mechanisms, etc., that allow to accompany European companies on the international market. Um, this type of structure, they exist in some member states. I mean, the bigger ones like France, Germany, Italy, for instance, they have national relays uh, to accompany their, uh, their national industries. But overall, we don't have that at the European level. This is also uh, um, something that creates a bit of, uh, of fragmentation because this national fragmentation of the European uh, geothermal industry globally creates competition between, for instance, a French and a German project uh, targeting, let's say, Chile. And uh, these, uh, whereas this, we could actually try to exploit the synergies and uh, between uh, between European uh, companies and the depths, let's say, of uh, of our economy and of our uh, geothermal industry, and this would also allow European companies to be more competitive against the big blocks of uh, of export that have a stronger um, type of diplomatic and um, and uh, administrative, let's say, support to uh, exporting. Uh, for instance, um, we can refer to the US, which uh, has a very very proactive structure behind its geothermal. Uh, um, it's just an industry, so uh, we can take the example of the 2017 U.S.-Mexico uh, geothermal diplomacy between brackets, um, which where well, we were in a situation where Mexico was in the process of allocating uh, concession for geothermal projects uh, as the market was opening up for the, the first uh, development of plants with, that were not operated by the national uh, company. And there, a lot of American companies were positioned on this uh, concession uh, bidding. Uh, and right after the election of Donald Trump, there was a lot of tension with Mexico uh, around various policy topics. I'm not going to come back to this, but um, what happened is the US State Department really put a lot of efforts in building the brand first of Mexico as a market where to invest, because Mexico was perceived very negatively in, uh, in the US. Uh, because of this, uh, this polarization, so really to show that there was uh, a lot of business opportunities in geothermal in Mexico, and to build also the brand of the American geothermal uh, industry in 
uh, toward the, the Mexican audience, so typically with uh, the organization of workshops, um, targeting uh, either uh, Mexican partners or uh, Mexican authorities. And there was also a very uh, thorough uh, assessment of the uh, Mexican geothermal market with the uh, publication of a Mexican uh, geothermal assessment by NREL, so the Nash, uh, yeah, I think it is National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, of, um, uh, which is a structure that is part of the, uh, of the US government. And this really allowed to, let's say, fix a bit the, the rift that might have appeared uh, otherwise. So this type of proactive um, diplomatic approach, which is really about uh, creating uh, connections, and it is quite soft skills in the end. It is not like uh, uh, really saying, you will be doing this project, here is uh, X amount of money, etc. But this is very, very important when it comes to internationalization, when it comes to exporting weather services, or products, but it is even more crucial for services because here it is typically longer term thing. It is not a one-off relationship like a selling, for instance, a, a given equipment. Um, so really uh, what we need from, uh, from the EU overall is to have a stronger proactive public action um, that um, really accelerate and facilitates uh, the export of, uh, of geothermal to uh, to companies, and it is also to have a stronger, uh, maybe a centralized framework to uh, to facilitate the process for companies, especially when they have lower administrative capacity and lower risk threshold. Geo Energy Europe is focusing on SMEs notably, and SMEs one of the barriers they have often to uh, uh, to exporting is they usually cannot really tolerate to have uh, too many failures in project. And when you're exporting, if you don't have the right information uh, or you don't have experience, you are more either at risk of failure or maybe you perceive the risk of failure as being too high and therefore you might not try to, to do it. So here having administrative structure at the European level uh, would be quite um, quite crucial in, uh, in enabling these SMEs, which are a very important segment of uh, the innovation, especially in, uh, in geothermal energy, to, to be able to thrive on the global market. Um, we also have um, the need for a European Union that is stronger in um, setting the rules and um, let's say enforcing the rules of global trade. What we are seeing often also is that uh, European companies might be a bit passed uh, by uh, companies from other um, trade blocks that have maybe a stronger political uh, backing behind them and maybe uh, benefit, for instance, from uh, loans or financing that come from uh, from their national countries, but with stronger limitation in terms of which company could be eligible. Um, and this, at the European level, we often provide, for instance, development finance, but with uh, less strings attached, let's say, when it comes to uh, which know-how uh, to, uh, to employ. Um, and then there is probably also a, a a very strong opportunity with the European diplomatic corps to uh, so uh, things like the uh, European uh, representation uh, of, uh, of the European external action service in the various uh, countries globally to collect information, provide an assessment of the regulatory framework, of the potential, of the uh, trends, etc., for especially renewable energy sectors and notably in our case, about geothermal energy. And this is especially important because right now what we're seeing is also that many European countries are, are seeing a bit of a contraction of their uh, diplomatic capacity and uh, the staff in their, uh, in their embassies, etc. And so here the EU could really play this role uh, to uh, to foster European uh, trade uh, globally and uh, and also contribute, which is a very strong uh, factor of uh, the European world building. So that is um, all for, for my presentation, but I'm happy to, to answer any question and thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. So indeed, now we have some time for, for discussion, maybe five more minutes because we have... So do we have any questions? You can use the Q&A, the chat, or you can raise your hand and we will open your mic. No, I don't think there's a question. 
here. So maybe think about it. You can always also send uh, your question via, via email and, and we will uh, answer to them. So if there's no question, it's maybe time to uh, conclude this uh, webinar also by inviting you to the next uh, event organized by the Geothermal Geoenergy Europe project. Sorry. It's uh, next Tuesday and the 28th of June. The topic is competitiveness of the European geothermal industry on the global market. Uh, it starts at 11 o'clock uh, Central European time. Um, and you will see that we will look at about global competitiveness, the global geothermal market, uh, focus on the turbine market. And, um, and to conclude on the industry supply chain too. I uh, thank you all for having attended this webinar and I wish you a good end of afternoon and see you on Tuesday for the second webinar of Geo in New York. See you, goodbye. Thank you all, goodbye. Goodbye.